Dr. Cindy Berger is a pediatric plastic surgeon who focuses her skills on helping kids who have suffered severe burns, been born with brachial plexus injuries, or or are in need of a reconstruction procedure of some kind. Children from all over the province come to her for treatment at BC Children's Hospital where she is head physician of the burn program. On Sunday, she will be part of a World of Smiles telethon on Shaw Multicultural Channel Cable 116. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Cindy Verger to Studio 4 to tell us more. More. Amazing work you do. Well, thank you. So take me to the beginning, your, your, your specialty. I know you're head of the burn unit, but I mentioned brachial plexal. Plexus. That's plexus, good. plexal. <laughs> but I don't know what that means. Um, my practice is pediatric plastic surgery, and I am director of the burn unit or the burn program at Children's Hospital, but that's probably less than a third of my practice. I do a lot of cleft lip and palate reconstruction. Mm. Um, I have a sort of a subspecialty in hand surgery, so kids that are born with a different hand, not enough fingers, too many fingers, webbed fingers, no thumbs. Um, we do some neuro uh, peripheral nerve surgery, so that's what a brachial plexus is. The, okay. The brachial plexus is a group of five nerves that comes from your neck and provides all of the movement and sensation to your arm. And when kids are born, in some cases they're pretty tough to get out and there can be some traction on the shoulder and it can actually pull those nerves and cause scar tissue and rupture of those nerves and so really at birth yeah at birth big babies especially and how soon can you recognize that immediately their immediately. arm is paralyzed at birth mm. and so a lot of them will get better on their own to a certain degree but we have a program where we follow them and some of them need surgery like microsurgical reconstruction of the mm -hmm. of the gap that occurs we put in nerve grafts and some of them need physiotherapy and splinting and um, most of them will get back to reasonably good function, but a severe brachial plexus injury can lead you, leave you with a paralyzed arm. And the recovery process? Takes between at least two years. Nerve recovery, nerves will grow mm. down past a scar through the nerve about an mm -hmm. inch a month. So it comes down and a baby's arm is only about a year long in its right. recovery. An adult with a brachial plexus injury, which we sometimes see with motorcycle injuries or you know, falls where you spread your shoulder away from your head, mm -hmm. they can be not recoverable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, cleft palate, what causes it? Multi, it's multifactorial. There is sometimes a family history. Um, it's uh, a different incidence in different races. So people who are Aboriginal or Asian in origin have a higher rate of clefting of both the lip and the palate than people who are um, Caucasian who are also higher rate mm -hmm. than people who have African origin. Um, there may be some folic acid um, responsibility where people have to take a little bit more folic acid in certain cases. Um, and there's some things like smoking and right. high fevers and things that can probably re be related. Really? So uh, it's preventive or not? We, mm. can, we can reduce it. If you, have reduce a it. if you have a child with a cleft, we would recommend, for instance, taking more folic acid in your next pregnancy to see if we can reduce the rate of um, right. the next child having a cleft. And how complex is the surgery? Because there's some, uh, some miracles happen. I've seen before and afters. Yeah, it's one of the most... Um, wonderful surgeries that I think I do. My favorite surgery is probably a cleft lip repair. You get immediate gratification. We, we do it, uh, the lip surgery at around three months of age and the palate surgery around nine to 12 months mm. of age. But generally kids who have both a cleft lip and palate will have several surgeries over the course of their life, probably five or six in average, um, just to follow growth and their teeth and bones and things like that. I see. Well. And then eventually uh, a child gets to a point where you can't even tell or not? When, if we're lucky, mm -hmm. that gets to the point. Of, I feel really privileged to work in a time when our techniques for cleft lip repair are actually better than they ever have been and the surgery that we use right now was developed by one of the surgeons at SickKids in Toronto that's superb. Wow. And uh, you know there's still mm -hmm. challenges and we, we're now getting to the point where it's not just whew, we got that lip together, it's we really want to make the nostril sill correct and the you know right. the lip line to be perfect and mm -hmm. the scar to be not so noticeable. When you were in med school, what did you do the first time when you fixed a lip? Like, do you remember that? When, um, the, when you actually got to do it? No, maybe not in med school, not, med in, school. <laughs> not quite then, but do you know what I mean? Like, it's always interesting to, to think about the first time I was actually in charge, yeah. had to do this myself, yeah. with some help, but. It's, it's a very, very gradual process. Mm. So 
um, what I tell my patients and, the, and their parents who are very concerned about trainees working with us because we're the only pediatric teaching hospital in the, yes. you know, in the province. Mm -hmm. And so if I want to teach someone how to do something so that they can be a good plastic surgeon, they have to do the procedure. And so it's a very gradual thing, you know, in your first year of residency you probably wouldn't even come close to, you know, doing right. anything in it. As you get to be more senior you may mm -hmm. do more and more of the case. And I always tell my patients that I never let anybody do anything that they can't do as well as me. It may take a bit longer, but the technique is there and I watch every, every moment. Sure. As far as doing it, it's really scary when you do something. I bet. Mm -hmm. Not so much. Is there an artist inside you uh, when you were younger? Did you, because to me plastic surgery, part of it, like a minor part of it perhaps, but is seeing and visual and... Yeah, I think, I mean, I never was an artist by any definition mm. that you could sell anything by, but I always like to build things and to uh, sew and things like mm. that. Uh, well, that's good. Yeah, I hope. <laughs> I, I, they have new kinds of stitches now. But a teaching hospital always, if if you have a choice of where to go, I think a teaching hospital is a magnificent place I totally agree. to be treated. Totally yeah, Totally agree. Totally. Uh, now, uh, the burn unit at uh, Children's, tell me about it. Well, we've been an independent burn program uh, only since about 1996. Before that, the children were looked after in the main burn unit at uh, VGH. Mm -hmm. And we've become, I think, a really great model for how we can look after burns. We have, um, look, we use an, a, a dressing that we only have to change twice a week now. And um, that means that kids don't have to be in hospital. They don't have to have sedation all the time for their dressing changes. And this dressing also helps to make wounds heal a bit faster. So we think we're grafting a bit less. The biggest change over the last two decades has probably been in prevention. So over the decade between 1995 and 2005, through prevention programs and um, uh, efforts in, in North America, the burn census reduced by about 50% which brings its own problems because sometimes yeah. we don't have enough burns to keep our mm, skills keep really, the really skills great. skills uh, um, on top but still uh, y y there's things you don't think about until you have a child like leaving your hair straightened or plugged in mm -hmm. do you know what I mean oh, yeah. because little kids well of course you do you're the pediatric <laughs> plastic surgeon but boiling we, our, every mother's always thought about boiling water on the stove yep. and where's the baby and that kind of, or most mothers, but we've seen some horrific accidents. It, it takes a second and we all have had near misses and I'll always tell my patients, you know how many times, I have three kids at home and when they were little, there were so many near misses and I just kept thinking, no, you can't be in the burn unit because that would right. just be really bad. Exactly. One of our nurses who has just gone out of her way for the last 10 years on a volunteer basis has created a really, really great prevention program for exactly what you're talking about and it's okay. called too Hot for Tots. The Too Hot for Tots video. That's right. That makes sense and, and I I haven't seen it but I was reading about it and something about seat belts which you'd never think about. Yeah. In the car like a hot seat belt on a, on a baby because their skin is so fine. Yeah. The main, the main, the most common burns that we see, th those do happen, the most common ones that we right. see have to do with scalds. And so hot coffee, hot tea, mm -hmm. you just don't think that so that right. you can get a 20% burn that leaves lifelong scars from your cup of tea. Yeah. And so what Francis has done um, is put together sort of the, the biggest risks and put put a, a, a DVD together. I do encourage you to watch it because it's really impactful. Okay, Too Hot for Tots. Too Hot for Tots. And too Hot for Tots. It's on the Children's Hospital website and it's really accessible. Great. But it, it's got lots of good information in it. And the first aid steps are if your child uh, spills your coffee on yeah. himself, what do you do? You cool it as quickly as you can. So you take whatever you have that's cool and you put it on to cool the burning process. Cold water, doesn't matter. Cold water, matter. glass of milk, you know, a, a, we, mm -hmm. in, immediately. In, immediately. The, the depth of the burn is determined by the hotness of the burning agent and how long it's applied to the skin. So if it's hotter, it takes less time. And if you can cool it down immediately, then you can take the time to sort of take the clothes off and get the child into the sure. shower and, and cool them down more properly. Okay, and that goes, I'm sure, for any burn. Yep, for any adults, burn. too. Any burn, immediately cool it off, right. no matter what it takes. Because if you think about it ahead of time, you do it. If you don't, you're That's trying right. to remember, am I supposed to put ointment on first and no water no, or what's, cool, yeah. <laughs> or just get it cool no matter uh, what. Yeah. Uh, 
so the first aid steps there. When do you call the hospital? Like at what point? Well, should if, you have a child checked? Yeah, if you if you have burns in sort of sensitive areas like uh, on the face or um, in you know in the groin area, some kids will get burned if they'll spill onto their lap, on their hands or their feet. If it's bigger if it's bigger than the size of a loony, you should probably see someone about it. It doesn't necessarily mean the hospital. If it's a large percentage of their body, they should definitely go by ambulance okay. to the hospital. So do you treat children who've been in fires? I'm sure you do. Yeah, fires are house less house fires. Yeah, house fires less common you know more commonly mm -hmm. scalds for for our age group right uh, and how, what your age group goes from we go 0 to 16 0 to 16 yeah. so it's mostly scalds Scald, and there's kind of two peaks there's the toddler age and then there's the teenage age mm. or the preteen age mm -hmm. where there's a little bit of experimentation and fire play and no, that happens. I, I yeah. was not supposed to ride on my boyfriend's motorcycle, but I didn't. It had the big hot pipe, and then I have oh, a big yeah. burn up your leg, and you're trying yeah. to tell your mother that you <laughs> fell in the park or something, you know? But she knew the difference. Moms mm -hmm. are smart. Moms are very smart, <laughs> yes. She thought I had been on a motorcycle, and she was right. Oh. And it hurt. That really? was a hot pipe, yeah. whatever I remember. Uh, a scar prevention today. Uh, there's nothing that can really prevent a scar. There's scar management that we do. There's there's different things that we can do to help a scar be its best. Mm -hmm. It takes almost a year for most people to mature a scar. So, if you have a scar, it'll go. It'll initially heal, and then it'll go through a period of being kind of hard and ropey and red for a while. Um, one of the best things that you can do is massage it. Just get your fingers on it and and massage and it and it. knead it and move it. And and there are various oils and potions and mm -hmm. lotions, thousands of them probably, which means that none of them really work very well. Right. We don't have great evidence in double-blind studies that any one particular one works, but okay. people, people use vitamin E and bio oil and right. I think as long as you're not allergic to them, probably none mm -hmm. of them are harmful and there may be some help in some of them, but it's hard to pinpoint exactly what that is. And if you get a blister, do you let the blister go, do you pop it or not? In a burn. Is the question. In, in a, a burn. burn. For me, I would pop it and put a dressing on it if it's loose. Um, sometimes thick blisters on your palms or on your feet mm -hmm. you can leave for a few days and it's a bit more comfortable. But Well, I know what it feels to just have a little burn and yeah. it's very painful. I can't imagine a severe burn. Yeah, it's. I think it may be among the most painful things that kids can mm -hmm. endure. We have um, specific pain protocols for kids in the ICU and we have um, the privilege at Children's Hospital of being able to almost completely sedate a child for their dressing changes, for big dressing changes. So they can come in as an outpatient and have um, intravenous um, medications that keep them very, very non-aware of the situation mm -hmm. for their dressing changes. Mm. So hopefully most of them won't have bad memories. And right. Yeah. yeah. Any new technology, uh, a laser treatment, anything? Always. <laughs> always? <laughs> always. There's always something new that's coming. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, the, there's, there's artificial skin products and different dressings. Um, lots, of, lots of things with silver. We use a lot of silver dressings that release a high degree of antibacterial agents and longer mm -hmm. periods of time. So a World of Smiles telethon uh, this Sunday. You'll be there, mm -hmm. 5 to 11. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think you will. <laughs> it says here on my card. Okay, I guess I better On come. Shaw TV, <laughs> Shaw Direct, a world of smiles, uh, raising uh, funds for all the right reasons. It's a great, great cause. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to see you.